Hello, and welcome back to Time Traveling Iron Man. We're currently in September of 2002, and in the last episode, we completed three iconic quests. That's not all the quests that were released in September of 2002, however, so we've got a couple more yet to complete. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump back in. So next up we have Sea Slug, and Sea Slug requires a new item, which is Swamp Paste. Normally for this quest, you would just purchase it from one of the vendors that sells it, but we don't have access to any vendors, so we actually have to make this by hand. In order to make it, use a pot of flour on a swamp tire, and then cook it on a cooking range in order to get a Swamp Paste. Apparently it needs to be made on a fire, damn it. This is actually a really good time to bring up one thing that I forgot to mention. A while ago when I got the magic shortbow requirement, good we did cook it, I thought we burnt it for a second. <laughs> a while ago when we got the magic shortbow requirement, I forgot to mention that I didn't need to get 75 fire making in that month because in RuneScape Classic you could only burn normal logs anyway. You can burn any higher tier, so that's why I never got that requirement. That won't be a requirement until RuneScape 2 comes out. All right, a quick detour now to recharge the glories and then we'll be on our way to complete sea slug. There we go, glory is recharged. Now we can actually cast Ardoin Teleport for the first time. And boom, we're right back in the city. That's actually amazing. So Sea Slug is another really straightforward rescue quest. This time it's Caroline and her husband and her son. Her husband and her son went out on the fishing platform just east of Ardoin and they haven't returned. She specifically calls out that no one's heard from any fishermen on the platform, which is really suspect because they normally write letters every week. So we've already rescued, what, like three people so far over the last couple months, so we might as well just go on another rescue mission. Caroline's friend Holgard is our ticket to the fishing platform, but his boat is currently destroyed and it'll need to be patched up, and that's where our swamp pace comes into play. With his boat patched up, we are now able to travel with Holgart over to the fishing platform. Upon first arrival, yeah, it's pretty obvious things are really off here. Everyone's just kind of dazed and confused and walking around like they don't have no idea what's going on. Almost like zombies, honestly. One tells me to keep away human or leave or face the deep blue. Um, that actually sounds like a pretty good idea, but first I need to see where uh, Caroline's husband and Kenneth are. There's also sea slugs all over the ground. If I try to take them, they bite me, so I can't really interact with them at all. There's one person who still seems to have their mind, and that's Bailey here in this hut to the west of the platform. Specifically, he calls out how since the sea slugs appeared, the fishermen have kind of been going crazy, and he doesn't really know why or what's going on. He does know that Kenneth is still on the fishing platform, though, probably hiding somewhere, so we're gonna go ahead and have a look. We find Kenneth holed up behind some boxes in one of the buildings in the upstairs of the fishing platform, and he tells me that his father Kent tried to leave about a week ago, but he hasn't heard from him since. So we're gonna go see if we can find him. Talking to Holgard about Kent's whereabouts, we decide to go have a look for him around the area and see if he wound up anywhere nearby. And sure enough, we find him shipwrecked on an island just a short way away from the actual fishing platform itself. Kent tells us about how he pulled in a huge catch one day, and then the fishermen started acting strange as the sea slugs began to take over. He instructs us to go back and help his kid first, but before we go, he actually discovers that a sea slug has taken root upon us, and he saves us, which is super nice. Thanks, Kent. Appreciate that. Back at the fishing platform, we try to go back up the ladder to speak to Kenneth, and there's a fisherman at the top who smacks us with a fishing pole if we try to go up. Ouch. So we're going to need a way to try to find to scare that fisherman away so we can get to Kenneth. Speaking to Bailey, he actually lets us know that the sea slugs are afraid of heat, so that'll be the key to getting back upstairs. He actually gives us an unlit torch that we can hopefully use to scare away the fishermen at the top of the ladder. But if I try to light it with my tinderbox, I find out that my tinderbox is damp from the sea crossing, which is uh, a bit of a problem. But thankfully, I found some sticks and some broken glass. So using the broken glass on the sticks, I can use the power of the sun to dry out the sticks. And then with the dry sticks, I can rub them together to create a fire and light my torch. And with a lit torch, I'm able to climb the ladder freely, thankfully. Speaking again to Kenneth, he is doing okay, but very, very scared. So we need to find a way to get him out of here. Because he's so scared, he is unable to go down the ladder and get to Hallgart normally. So we're gonna have to find a quicker way for him to get down. First thing what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kick this badly repaired wall outside of his hiding place in order to create an escape route. Then what we can actually do is we can rotate this crane in order to create a foothold for Kenneth to jump onto in order to get to Hallgart a lot faster than climbing down normally. So let's inform Kenneth of our plan and let's get out of here. Uh, 
All right, all that's left for us to do with Kenneth safely escaped to Holgrip's raft is get out of here ourselves. So let's do that. I went off this creepy fishing platform. Come on, Holgrip, let's get the hell out of here. And then we can speak to Caroline to turn in the quest as Kenneth and Kent have already returned successfully. And that's quest complete. A lot of fishing experience for this one. This is actually one of the best early game quests to do as you get a large fishing boost from it, but obviously we can't really benefit from that because we're already level 76. Also as a reward, we get these oyster pearls, which were a little notable back in the day as they were used to create a new type of ammunition in pearl-tipped crossbow bolts. But in the crossbow expansion sometime in 2006, they were updated to go on iron bolts instead of bronze bolts. I don't have access to iron bolts, so I won't really be making any, and they're not really that useful anyway, so it doesn't really make sense to save these, I don't think. Though it is worth noting that there is a small piece of content there that we can explore later. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention is this quest actually had a 30 fire making requirement. Thankfully, I already had that from doing some other random activities in the past, but this is one of the first major fire making requirements released for a quest. Okay, just one more quest left for this month. Let's go ahead and get that one done. So our final quest for this month actually takes us all the way up here on top of the Backstorian Falls, which is an area I got to visit early thanks to having to complete the bar crawl. But now we can officially visit for the first time as it's actually released. In this house here, situated on the river just north of the falls, is a mom, and she's looking for her son. So we have another rescue mission to go on, unfortunately. It seems like pretty much every single quest this month was just a rescue mission, and that's not the most interesting thing in the world, but this will at least turn into something a little little bit more interesting than just that. She says that he was out playing by the river for a while and hasn't returned, so we head over to the river here and use this raft that's just, I guess, sitting on the river? I guess this family really likes to go raft rafting a lot. Boarding the raft, we crash on some rocks here further down the river past some rapids, and what do you know? It's Hudan. He is just chilling here on the riverbank. If I talk to him, he immediately gets defensive and claims that I'm also looking for some treasure that he's apparently looking for. I had no idea there was any treasure involved, but now I'm really interested. I try to get him to go back home, but he says he's not going to return home until the treasure is found, and he's a rich man. I guess he's got some big dreams. If I ask him about the treasure, he tells me that he won't tell me anything about it, because otherwise I'll be competing for it, and that's not good. So I gotta respect the hustle, that's for sure. All that said, our quest is basically done. We talked to Hudan, he won't go home, and there's nothing else we can do, right? No, of course, we're gonna go find this treasure right from under his nose. Let's continue down the river and see what we can find. Using this rope to find a cavern on the side of the waterfall, which is actually really cool. I always thought this part of the game looked really cool, even with the outdated old school RuneScape graphics. It's just a pretty ambitious setting for sure. There is a door here, but we can't open it. So we're just gonna go ahead and hop in this barrel and get safely down the waterfall. We emerge the river a short ways down and the fisherman immediately talks to us. He says that other adventurers have come, he through here looking for the treasure but have failed so far and the rumor is that there's treasure within the waterfall so i think that's the best place to look he recommends talking to hadley the tourist guide who is in this welcome center just right here by the waterfall. This place is pretty well developed to have a welcome center this nice. Considering there's like not many houses in the area, it's kind of interesting. Hadley lets us know that the reason that the falls are called the Baxtorian Falls is because they're named after the elven king that's buried beneath them. So I assume the treasure has something to do with uh, Baxtorian's grave. Apparently Baxtorian had been away fighting a battle and returned home to find his wife Galadriel had been taken by the enemy. He sought her out for years but was unable to find her and as a result he basically shut himself into the waterfall and died there. That's actually really tragic. Ever since, no one's been able to enter his tomb. Hadley recommends grabbing a book from upstairs here, and we will do just that to read more about the history of the falls. The first thing that the book mentions is, in order to visit the grave of Galariel, we're going to need Galariel's pebble, which was stolen by a gnome family over a century ago, but might still exist under the tree gnome village, so we're going to go ahead and go there and check that out. The book also goes through some of the lore around Galariel and Baxtorian. I won't get super in-depth here as it's all just kind of flavor text, but there are some interesting pieces in here, such that how Baxtorian was able to use runestones to control water, earth, and air, sort of like we do with magic spells. There's also a poem in here written by Baxtorian himself, which is kind of interesting. 
interesting. Okay, with this book in hand, it seems like our next step is to head to the Tree Gnome Village and search out this pebble. And we actually have a much faster way to get to the Tree Gnome Village thanks to the spirit trees. So let's head up to the Grand Exchange and use the spirit tree there. Just outside the village, we find the cave that's mentioned in the book on Baxtorian, and it's been overrun by zombies and hobgoblins, which is not very great for that gnome family. I hope they're still alive. Thankfully, there is still one gnome alive in here, and he's just shut himself in behind a locked gate to protect himself from the hobgoblins. Poor guy. A little bit of rummaging around the other room in the cave here, and we find the key. That easy. Letting ourselves in, we talk to Glory once more, and we trade him the key for the pebble. Apparently he just had the pebble knocking around that easily, so that is extremely useful. I mean, I can't hold on to anything for like two weeks without losing it, let alone a hundred years. Okay, pebble in hand, we need to head back to Ardoin and then head back up to the Baxtorian Falls, so I'm going to use my Ardoin Teleport. <laughs> Super nice. Absolutely love having this teleport. So just outside the Baxtorian Falls, there's a very ornate looking grave here. And if we read it, we can see that it's actually Glorial's tombstone. So thankfully that wasn't too hard to find. We will need to drop our runes on the ground here because you cannot bring any weapons into the tomb. But I think we won't be here very long, so hopefully it shouldn't be too big of a deal. I don't want to lose those law runes for sure. As you can see, the tomb itself is kind of overrun by monsters, but we have Protect from Melee, so I'm not too worried about that either. Two items that we need from in here. One is uh, Glariel's Amulet, which you get from the chest over here, and the other item is just down this passageway. And that's Glariel's Burial Urn, so we need to bring both of these back to the Baxtorian Falls, and we can go from there. And thankfully our runes are still here waiting for us. So heading back down the the river to get to the entrance to Bextorian's tomb. We talk to Hudan again and he asks us to share the treasure with him when we find it and I say nope I'm not going to and he says that's not fair and I say neither is life kid. Damn so savage. So the key to entering this door here on the side of the waterfall is actually equipping Glariel's amulet in order to get through the door. After you complete the quest, you no longer need the amulet to enter the cavern, but back in the day you needed this amulet every single time you wanted to come into this dungeon. Now after the quest, I am going to not save the amulet as I feel like I can take advantage of that little improvement as it's a quality of life improvement for sure, so I won't be using the amulet to come back in here after the quest. So first thing we're going to do is have a snoop around the room to the right here which is full of skeletons and skeleton mages and find a key, as there's always a hidden key, right? Then we'll head into the room on the left and use the key to unlock the door to Baxtorian's tomb. And here we are, the tomb itself. You can see there is a hovering cup above us, which is kind of interesting, as well as a statue of Baxtorian and a statue of Glorial. Now there's a certain order of things we need to do in here in order to get access to the treasure, and honestly, I have no idea how you're supposed to figure this out. I think it has something to do with this poem at the very end of the book on Baxtorian, but I don't know. Basically, I need to use one of each of these rune stones on each of these pillars, so six total. And then a mountain will come up in the middle, and then I get to use the urn on the cup, and then we get the treasure. I don't know, it's, it's really convoluted, and I couldn't figure out how to figure this one out without a guide. So just in case you were curious, this one seems really hard. Definitely let me know if you know how to solve this puzzle in the comments without looking at a guide, because I didn't find the, the correct clues around the game. Now that the runes are done, we put the amulet on the statue of Glaro, and then instead of just taking the treasure from the chalice, we use the urn on the chalice instead. Boom! Quest complete! We found the treasure just like that. 40 mithril seeds, as well as some diamonds and some gold bars. The diamonds are actually incredibly useful. And the mithril seeds are interesting as well. Also a massive amount of attack and strength experience, but because of my level I didn't gain a single level. My goodness. It's been ages since I've done this quest and not immediately shot up like 20 combat levels. Oh well. Poor Hudan, man. I finished the quest and I got the treasure. You did not get any for yourself. So if you notice, we actually passed some fire giants on the way in, and this is really, really important. And for, that'll be for a reason that I will explain in the next episode. Now one thing I will do is I will plant all these mithril seeds because I want to see if I can get a white or a black set of flowers, which is the rarest. There's a bunch of colors you can get, but for the most part they're pretty much 
the same rarity except for the white or the black flowers. They're a pretty cool item though because you can grow flowers in the world kind of like you could with a fire. There we go. Unfortunately, no luck. I did grow one set of flowers and forget to pick them. So there's a chance that those were red or black because every time you grow the flowers in the world, it's the same color, even though they are different colors in your inventory when you pick them up. So actually, never mind. I just looked it up and back in RuneScape Classic, Mithril Seeds used to make a small tree instead of flowers and you couldn't interact with the tree in any way, including getting any flowers from it. The flowers were actually released with RS2, so unfortunately I cannot hold on to the blue flowers. Hey, it's me from the future. So I actually realized I totally forgot that there was a new highest healing food item released this month, at least highest healing per slot, and that's pineapple pizza. So we should go ahead and make one. Thankfully, we can grab a pineapple from here on the west side of Brimhaven now. There are pineapple plants that you can pick to get a pineapple from. Actually, I didn't realize this, but apparently you can get multiple from one plant now. Uh, can you get unlimited? That's pretty cool. No, you can get five, which doesn't really make much sense because I thought pineapples were one per plant, but hey, we got five pineapples now. And of course, we pay our good friend Eggie here a visit to steal her cheese and tomato, as I believe it's still the only location in game to actually obtain these items. Churning milk is not added for a very long time and farming even more. Okay, so now we have all of our ingredients together. So now we just use the pot of flour on the bowl of water in order to get a pizza base. Use the tomato on the pizza base to get a tomato base with pizza. Use the cheese on that to get an uncooked pizza. Slice the pineapple into chunks. Cook the pizza and then use the pineapple chunks on the pizza. And boom, we actually have a pineapple pizza that heals 22 hit points in two bites. That's actually pretty notable because that's a 10% increase over my previous best healing food, which is sharks at 20 per, per bite. However, the trade-off is it'll take literally ages to make any large amount of these as again, the tomato and cheese is extremely limited in quantity. Not to mention the time to grind the flour and everything, but a pretty cool food item to have nonetheless. Okay, all that done, that'll be the end of this episode of Time Traveler Iron Man. Definitely thank you for watching. We had a lot of quests to do in the last couple episodes, including this one, so thank you for bearing with me as we basically just did by release again. Next episode, things should get a little bit more interesting as we have to take on potentially the longest grind that this account will see yet. I'm incredibly excited to jump in though, because it's been a little bit since I've had a grind to just sink my teeth into, and I hope you're looking forward to it as well. Of course, we can't leave with without a huge thank you to all the members who have joined the channel. The support means so much to me and thank you so much for joining. And of course, a double huge thank you to all those members who have joined at the top tier. OneKiller912, PeepoTime, KittyLine, MadHatter, and Gwyn. Thanks again for watching and I will see you in the next one. Take care everyone.